I remember stepping off the bus with my, with my buddies. And I can remember being very young and being with my father and just being awestruck. I looked around, here's this silver spaceship driving in. Among this whole sea of cars on the road, here was this thing coming down the road that just looked like nothing else. The one that sticks out in my head would have been the C4 Grand Sport. And it was a white uh, C4 convertible. It was a C5 Corvette, bright yellow. It, it's this awe-aspiring vehicle. It's an attainable vehicle, but it's also something that is born out of pure function. And quite frankly, by the time you get to eight, it's the full embodiment of what that is. Over the course of my career, I've been involved with Corvette on one level or another, probably from my first day of becoming part of the Corvette team, all the way to the current 2020 Stingray. I became the uh, director of design for Corvette for the sixth generation. And during, during the development of each of those, there are probably a few significant key design elements. Those are the heritage of Corvette, what are those elements throughout the years, whether it's proportion, surface, graphics, that you can identify and then distill down to their basic elements in a timeless way. Like for instance, the, the fender shapes, the profile, the proportion really is, is big. We have this canopy, on a lower fuselage like a jet fighter. That's probably the second element is aircraft have been inspirational. And why is that? Because they're usually high performance, they're, they're purpose driven, there's a singular mission for them, and it relates to Corvette beautifully. Another aspect is racing. Racing has also had a huge influence on Corvette, and particularly, the, obviously, the, this last 2020. Uh, Stingray is a culmination of all that experience. Well, the character that you see of the car, the design, is influenced by the functional aspects of the race vehicles. We kind of had that innate history of what's coming from of the past two generations for sure and now three. My point is, is that you see this level of function and continue to grow and grow. And then you get back into the racing program at the same time then. And you see that where the track starts to become the inspiration for, for the regular man. And I, I think that's always been a beautiful part about Corvette is that we're going to the track with this, we're doing our best to win. Obviously it's a shift in where we've placed a motor, but the reality is, is what caused that shift was what you saw grow from four to five to six to seven. We peaked out where we were at, and it was time to move on. And I remember clearly Tad Jecter, the chief engineer, saying, you know, we've optimized this platform as much as we possibly can. Now it's time to go to mid-engine. The move of a Corvette from front to mid-engine, you could call it a risk, but for us uh, inside of Design Center, it was something that's always been beneath the surface. And it's something that just never quite made it out of the gate. And since I've worked at GM, there were mid-engine Corvettes around. For the past 60 years, uh, since Zora Arcus Duntoff was trying to make a mid-engine Corvette, there were many, many iterations. We've always researched and experimented and developed concepts around mid-engine proportion. So it's almost like no wine before it's time because it has been tried for years. It'd probably be like in a 2011-ish 
time frame where we started uh, talking about the mid-engine again. We started having meetings as to what we would do with the package, uh, what would we need for content, and that's we started scripting uh, what we would like to, the mid-engine car to do at that time. As a designer, you don't often get to work on something that's new essentially from ground up. And this car is new from ground up. We had three full-size models, clay models, uh, with a different theme on each side. We probably had at least 12 scale models. You know, a scale model we would develop uh, for two weeks and decide, you know, was there merit to the design? If it didn't have merit, then we would just drop that scale. So we were constantly, you know, churning and uh, reworking scales as we were looking for, for a lot of themes in that. By moving to the mid-engine layout, what that enabled as far as from a performance figures, as far as interior layout and visibility, going from the, the C7 Corvette to the C8, the seventh generation Corvette had kind of that arc of driver controls in front of you. And now we were taking it and literally kind of turning it on its side and making it really this three-dimensional thing that you were sitting in. The difference of how extreme, how, how much lower the IP is, how much richer all the materials are, how much uh, more sculptural and three-dimensional the interior space is. I think that's going to be a really uh, big takeaway and something that a lot of people aren't going to be expecting when they get inside of it. If you jump from a current Corvette C7 to the C8, the experience that the customer is going to get, when you start adding that all together, it's hard to, to look at a going to a mid-engine configuration as a risk. Um, it's going to take all those things that the front engine car did and just take them to the next level. So if I have to sum the whole thing up, I'm most proud that we were able to achieve everything that we set out to do. But what I actually think the greatest success was is that as you get in it and you use it, you don't really notice that you're doing something different. It feels intuitive. It feels like you're a part of the car. It feels like the right decision. It, it's delivering something that would usually be almost seen as something so exotic or unattainable. It makes it where this experience can be yours. It's, it makes it to a much higher volume of people that can actually have something and, and get behind the wheel and drive something uh, that's gonna feel completely like forbidden fruit, right? It's like, oh, you would have never thought you could get a car like that. Although we all feel a sense of accomplishment for, you know, finally this was the right time to introduce, to work on and introduce a mid-engine Corvette. But I'm here to tell you that that is just the tip of the iceberg. Just imagine where it can go from this point. This is just the beginning. Just as you start to understand design, there are certain things in your life that strike you as, yes, this is correct. And somehow you have an innate relationship to it. You may not be able to describe it or understand it, but you just feel comfortable. It feels right, and it feels natural. It's this awe-inspiring vehicle, but it's also something that is born out of pure function. And quite frankly, by the time you get to eight, it's the full embodiment of what that is. We dreamed about it for years, but I would say 30 years ago, no one in a million years would have dreamed about us developing this at the Nurburgring. This car is not evolutionary, it's revolutionary. And you only get one chance to do it right. in a lifetime.
time chance. The expectation is so high for this car. And the excitement level is so high for this car. A Corvette has to be a very good Grand Touring vehicle. Um, you have to be able to, to go uh, get groceries at the grocery store and then go conquer the Nürburgring as well. We dreamed about it for years, but I would say 30 years ago, no one in a million years would have dreamed about us developing this at the Nürburgring. Being at the Nürburgring is the toughest test for a vehicle period, and the reason for that is we have all sorts of events during one lap. So one lap of this, you're gonna reach the top speed of the vehicle. You're gonna reach maximum ladder acceleration and very high speeds. I think it's something like 15 corners on this track, your max lap acceleration at over 90 miles an hour. And of those 15, like 12 of them are over 120. You can't find that in North America. If the car is just slightly not dialed in, it exacerbates it tremendously here. We, it's a small problem on normal tracks or on a highway. It seems like a big problem here. I mean, and it's good for development engineers because it points out very clearly, very quickly, this is something we need to improve. Right, what else are we gonna throw on the pile? Um, I also wanted to see if I could get that um, same steering event that I had. I'm gonna want to look at the data in that just to see exactly what happened. So you, you were turning the corner and the, the entire time you were staying away from center into the corner, you had higher efforts than you expected. Rather than being linear, it was just, it was sort of increasing and then, then dropping off. It felt unusual and didn't feel as it had. Okay. And it was, it was like I, I had confused the car somehow. So which run? Like was this, do you, do you this was my first run on the warm surface. When you look at the group of guys who've come here, it's a great team of people who've all sort of coming together and we've all got this one goal of, of getting that car better, getting it faster here on the racetrack at the Nürburgring. We bring it to the Nürburgring because it exercises everything from a track perspective, but we also take the cars on the Autobahn while we're here because we want it to be very comfortable at any speed on the Autobahn. We want it to be very comfortable um, on the kind of roads that you see in Europe. I was just saying, Brian, I, I did a, a Z51 versus the C8 here on the country roads. Oh, right, and so yeah. some of the roads that are windy and really quick and, I mean, I loved it on the track and everything yesterday, but that'll jump out at anybody that drives a car anywhere. You know, you don't have to be on uh, Nürburgring. Yeah, we're, we're quickly learning. We don't have to look backwards anymore. Prior generation Corvettes um, with front engine have achieved such high levels of performance and we feel like we've gotten to where physics uh, demand us to move to the new architecture and we're seeing the results uh, with the mid-engine in what we're able to achieve uh, in the car. It behaves exactly like we wanted a mid-engine car to behave. It's just fundamentally different how it changes direction versus the front wheel drive cars that we have. 
the location of the center of gravity is different. So your perception of how the car rotates and translates is different. You've got a lot more weight in the back now, so you can start to use a lot more of the acceleration. You can ramp up some of the uh, engine parameters to get more torque to the ground. From mid-corner to corner exit, you're able to apply much more throttle than a front engine Corvette. Um, where the balance is 50-50 as opposed to 60-40. The way that this car gets off corners, how it accelerates when you get on the throttle and shift the load onto the rear, uh, it's just, it's amazingly improved over anything we've done before. It's so much easier to place in the corners and the precision of where you can put the car is different. When you're sitting on the center of gravity of a car, the car is rotating about you. You're not sitting out in the periphery and the car rotates about a point distant from you. Because ultimately, the Corvette is about providing a driving experience. And so we're trying to take that uh, to the next level. To me, the driving experience is, is excellent. You know, the way that you, the feedback that you're getting from both ends of the car, the way that the car is driving into the corner, the way the car is turning around you, you feel like you are the, the focal point inside the vehicle, which, you know, th there's definitely been a unique characteristic about driving every Corvette, whether that's been a C5, a C6, a C7. Now this mid-engine car is really quite a step change, but I feel that they've really nailed it. You know, they've, they've nailed the concept and the feel of the car, particularly on track. And, you know, that's, that's really where my experience is. I think people will see the benefits of why we move to mid-engine very quickly when they drive the car. There's a lot more technology in the car than we've ever had um, in a Corvette. The development of that technology and how everything works together and integrates to enhance that driver experience, that's really what the team's kind of focused on. ELSD development, steering, ABS, transmission, engine team members, everything the driver experiences, feels, touches is affected and we're able to tune all of those things on the fly to enhance that driver experience. The approach was to get everybody together at the track, which typically our ride and handling group and our controls group and our energy group sort of doing each of their own thing. And then we would come together and put the car back together. With this car, um, we're all at the track at the same time. So that change has been in for a little bit? Because like, I don't think you guys have updated it. Okay. Okay. Because you're getting a lot of like low diesel. So we just cranked that guy up. Yeah, we had the opposite where like that situation was actually underbraked because it was holding the rear. Right. The team synergy using kind of different parameters and new ideas, new technology, and that's really part of the teamwork. That's part of the chemistry that makes things happen. Everything is integrated. Everything is so tightly packaged. Uh, you can't move one thing in the inside of the car without affecting a whole bunch of other things. Those people sharing ideas about all the different um, technologies we have on the car and how they can all come together. And every time you get in the car, it was a little bit better. It was a big day to step back from that and say, okay, we're there. And now we've got this bandwidth that we can work in to get the car just right. There's, there's so many components, the integration level, the level of detail where traction control is interacting with the transmission, with the suspension. It's coming together with such smoothness and refinement that I think it's unlike anything else we've done. This team is one of the most high-powered teams I think we've ever had doing development of a vehicle. So um, congrats to you guys. Brand new transmission, a mid-engine new architecture, and for all those things to come together and, and be able to have that proof of the pudding at the hardest track in the whole world uh, yesterday says a lot about the whole team and, and how hard you guys have worked to get to this point. All the work that we're doing right now is very fine tuning uh, to, to make sure that at that very edge of the envelope, the car is very well refined, very drivable. So we are, we are almost done. <laughs>
After the first few days here, it's kind of become clear to me that there's no question the C8 is going to be a revolutionary jump from the C7. It's going to open a lot of people's eyes on how well General Motors can make a exotic sports car and actually perform at an extremely high level. There's no question in my mind. This car is not evolutionary, it's revolutionary. And you only get one.